Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our last session. Um, I am Julie Gritzmacher. I'm the Director of Patient Advocacy and Population Health at Prevent Blindness, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. I am a white woman in my early 40s. I have long, brown, curly hair, and I am wearing a red blouse. I run the Aspect Program at Prevent Blindness, which aims to equip individuals with knowledge, skills, and confidence to become advocates for eye health, vision and eye health. So I'm really excited to close out this event with three wonderful graduates of the ASPECT program, Larry Johnson, Bill Porter, and Janetta Price. I've deeply enjoyed getting to know each one of them through the program, and I know you'll enjoy hearing their stories and reflections on the theme of being seen and heard. And now, I welcome Larry Johnson to share his story. I'm a 90-year-old white male with white hair. I'm wearing a light blue checkered shirt and a pair of black sunglasses. I want you first to close your eyes for just a moment. Now open them wide and look at me, not as a patient or client or a victim, but as a person, a whole person. And talk to me, not to my daughter or my friend or my companion, but to me. And listen to me. I mean, really listen. I may be able to tell you something about me that could change your opinion, your diagnosis, or your treatment plan. I know my body far better than what your tests or examination may reveal. There is more to me than my problem of not seeing well. There's my personal lifestyle, my fears, my frustrations, my hopes and dreams, my tenacity and determination, or my lack thereof. And what about my secondary chronic health conditions? Recent research data reveals a dramatically higher prevalence of chronic health conditions among older people with vision impairments compared to those without vision impairments. 19% of visually impaired individuals report having had a stroke versus just 5%, 7% of those without visual impairment. 43% versus 25% have diabetes. 26% versus 15% suffer from depression. And visually impairment among seniors significantly increases their risk of falling and having an injury. 49% versus 30%. So clearly, physicians and public health professionals need to be looking at more than just the diagnosis of visual impairment but the full spectrum of the person's physical and mental health. What is it like to go blind for a person who has had sight all of their life? It's traumatic. It's life-changing. Suddenly, you're no longer able to just jump in the car and drive to the corner store and pick up a gallon of milk or a newspaper. You can no longer see the faces of your children or grandchildren. You're afraid to do your own cooking. You feel angry, depressed, helpless. Some people, when they go blind, even think about ending their life. Yes, there's a whole lot more than just diagnosing the eye condition, prescribing eye drops or injections. There's the need for patient counseling possible referral to a vision rehabilitation specialist or a low vision support group. But it's not really about me. It's about us. The four and a half million of us, older Americans who currently experience severe vision loss. 
The Department on Aging and the State Departments on Health and Human Services provide a wide range of health and human services programs for older Americans to help ensure their well-being and independent living choices. Lamentably, however, many of these programs and services are not well known by healthcare professionals or by older Americans who may be experiencing vision loss. This represents a major disconnect. If individuals do not know where to go or what resources are available. So what's needed? I propose two initiatives. First, a great deal more collaboration and information sharing among healthcare providers, clinicians, vision rehabilitation specialists, aging network partners, community stakeholders, and vision loss support groups so that older Americans with vision loss can learn about programs and services in their communities that can assist them to learn how to live with less vision. Also, there needs to be much more public education and outreach about these programs and resources to adults who are experiencing vision loss and to their families. Second, there are huge gaps in education and sensitivity awareness training related to vision loss within both the aging services network and the healthcare profession. These include a lack of knowledge about appropriate interaction and understanding of individuals experiencing vision loss. So training should include recognizing the fear, the vulnerability, the sense of loss of control, new family dynamics, and the need to learn new ways to live life. The goal should be to reduce the tendency toward paternalism when treating or assisting older people with vision loss. Beginning with the commitment to learn more about and collaborate with local health care and senior services partners in your community. Share information about programs and services that can help older persons with vision loss and educate yourself and your office staff on how to interact more effectively and more appropriately with individuals who have a visual impairment. The end goal should be for older individuals experiencing vision loss to be able to remain in their own homes if they so choose and live out those golden years with dignity and independence. At the end of the day, Patients don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Remember, we are your customers, and so you need us as much as we need you. Take the time to talk with us, learn to listen to us, and make those healthcare decisions about us with us. You would want the same if the roles were reversed. And now, Bill Porter. Thanks so much, Larry. My name is Bill Porter. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a white male in my late 40s. I have crew cut, receding brown hair, and an auburn beard, and I'm wearing a light blue collared shirt with a red tie. Progressively losing your vision loss due to an inherited retinal disorder presents challenges and limitations like navigating dark and crowded places and giving up the freedom of driving. What is often overlooked is the widespread cultural misunderstandings about vision loss and the challenges the blind community faces beyond physical limitations. With the medical model of a disability as the dominant view, the discourse on blindness has long been focused on pity and find fixing people, cure culture. The societal perspective reinforces othering and demonstrates a lack of empathy or consideration for ability and life experience. Even in an era where organizations are making significant investments in diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, only 4% include disability in their programs. Visual disabilities are a part of one's identity and deserve to be included in efforts to celebrate diversity and address inequities. I discovered I had retinitis pigmentosa when the symptoms started to appear in elementary school. 
My mother, who also has RP, advised me not to tell anyone. At times, it became unavoidable. My vulnerability resulted in some of my peers teasing me or playing tricks on me. My mother's perspective on this and the experiences, these experiences reinforced shame about my identity and gave credence to the public perception that blindness is something to be ashamed of and kept secret as much as possible to avoid conflict and discrimination. In the summer after graduating high school, I scheduled an appointment at a world-renowned inheritable retina disorder center for formal diagnosis. I was eager to see a specialist about my vision loss and go where I would finally be understood and supported. Unfortunately, my visit was far from it. I was subjected to a full day of uncomfortable tests and unpleasant bedside manner from the medical team. The day concluded with a visit to the lead ophthalmologist who had over 25 years experience researching RP and treating patients. The enthusiasm I felt walking into his office was quickly extinguished. He told me I should give up on my dreams of being an artist and suggested I not enroll in art school or any college. He also told me to stay indoors during the day and avoid exposure to sunlight. There was no hope or encouragement, but rather a message that my life is worthless unless they can, he can find a cure. It was 31 years ago, um, last week, as of last week, 31 years ago, and I still refer to it as the worst day of my life. I shouldn't have been surprised due to our family's history there. His social workers encouraged my mother never to have children because a life with vision loss was not a life worth living, citing the high suicide rates in the blind community. Were they aware that they were also in indirectly telling her that her life wasn't, was worthless? I had an aptitude for visual art and was a passionate about being an artist early in childhood, years before noticing symptoms of RP. It's always been one of my true passions and it is a critical part of my identity that defines me more than my inherited written disorder. I ignored the advice of the esteemed doctor and Harvard professor and used my de desire to prove him wrong as added motivation. I earned a BFA and MFA and I've been successful as a professional artist and educator for over 20 years. Despite my accomplishments, I was in a mentally unhealthy space for most of my life. I bottled up shame about my identity and was afraid to face my progressive vision loss and how it would impact my future. That is, until it became unavoidable. Awkward moments became, in public began to mount. I was considered rude for not shaking someone's hand that I didn't see. I was yelled at for bumping into people who cut me off in crowded public spaces. And when I walked into a pillar in front of the public safety desk at the art college where I teach, a security guard asked if I was drunk. It was clear that it was trying to hide my disability was creating problematic misunderstandings and it was time to be open about my blindness and face the challenges that come with it. Despite the fears I had about the attention it would bring, I started using a white cane in crowded public spaces because of its potential to help me navigate and more importantly, its ability to serve as a visual cue to others that I am visually impaired, decreasing the likelihood of collisions and social miscues. But unfortunately, my magic wand was no match for the kryptonite that is our unaware ableist culture. The misguided American perception of blindness is absolute, and many people are skeptical of individuals who openly identify as disabled as they could be faking it, which is one of the many symptoms of our culture's misrepresentation of blindness. As a result, I can uh, constantly at odds with myself as to whether to use my cane. It both helps me avoid conflict and gets me into it. I've been grabbed without warning and dragged away from where I wanted to go. Other strangers shower me with pity and offer to pray for me to be cured. If I'm holding my cane, I feel like I have to act blind uh, by not reading signs, looking at my phone or making eye contact, because if I do, I risk someone shouting, he's a faker. And yes, this has happened to me. The white cane is just one of many examples of how our collective misunderstanding and miseducation on disability can often be more significant challenge for the blind community than the physical symptoms of blindness. It's everywhere, including places you would least expect. Organizations that raise funds for research focus on curing blindness causing diseases and play fear and pity to solicit donations, which is exploitive and disrespectful to the individuals they claim to support. Feel good stories appear at the end of nightly news broadcasts and the news article headlines, what Stella Young labeled as inspiration porn. Stories where someone overcame their blindness to fill in the blank, right? Like overcoming their blindness to earn a college degree or something like that. The only obstacle in that case would be lack of accessible course materials, which is a legal obligation. Ableism also appears in the schools for the blind and vocational training programs. Many institutions set the bar low and impose restrictions on life goals and career aspirations. And in the medical field, which I already covered, is way too often the focus is on the glory of finding a cure and the patient's humanity is not considered. We need to move beyond the narrow perspectives that blindness is strictly a medical condition that needs to be fixed. It's not a contradiction to support medical research while also embracing blind identity. 
It's part of who we are and our diversity should be celebrated. We need to be included in DEI initiatives. We need to be see ourselves and respectfully represented in TV and film, showcasing the spectrum of blind identities and the ranges of visual disabilities. 20% of Americans identify as disabled, but only 1% of characters are disabled. And in most cases, they're inaccurate and harmful representations, not written, directed, or played by someone who has that disability. We need to up our, update our language. Blind and sight is often a meta, used as a metaphor for ignorance and obliviousness, like you're blind to the fact. We need to steer away from pity in favor of empathy. And I would love if, if people would stop making confident accusatory assumptions when they have no knowledge of the situation. It would dramatically improve my quality of life if people ask questions before casting judgment. We have a long way to go, but there are reasons to be optimistic. A movement is emerging. It's, it's happening right here, right now, and in many other places, including where I reside in the realms of art and higher education. Museums and galleries are finally starting to respectfully showcase the work of blind and visually impaired artists which is a powerful way to elicit meaningful discourse and disability, disability cultural centers are being established at college campuses around the country. I encourage you to create a platform for discussing these topics in your communities and identify, identifying modes for change. Talk to someone else about the session, start a book club, an affinity group, or develop programs that uplift voices. There may not be a cure for blindness, but with education, we can cure ableism, which is the biggest threat to our quality of life. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Janetta Price. Thank you. I am Janetta Price. I am a plus size, rich chocolate sister, and I have about 30 inches of wet and wavy hair flowing like Shaka Khan with some pink popping lipstick and pink pair of earrings that dangle from my ear. With that being said, can I just take you guys down memory lane? I remember when I first heard those words from my ophthalmologist. You're not blind enough to be considered legally blind. You're not blind enough to receive benefits. I'm so sorry. You're just not blind enough. To be honest, I had enough because I was blind enough to lose my job I was blind enough to lose my driver's license. I was blind enough to lose my independence. I was blind enough that I could not see my face in the mirror for years. I cried because I could barely get a ride. I was blind enough to lose my voice, afraid to be seen on the scene, running from the light, bumping into the dark. I prayed that no one could see my blindness. For this reason, I pretended to be sighted. As I missed the curve and fell into a deep depression for years, I was mentally ill with no will to live. Glaucoma was my death sentence to me. I isolated myself, racing thoughts of suicide. I'd rather be dead before I live in darkness. I questioned my purpose on purpose. I told myself that I had no purpose. To be honest, I was humble. Check this out. I'm not walking with no stick. Don't call me the B word. According to my doctors, I'm not blind enough. Oh, trust me. I would never ride that little bus. I realized that it was I who was holding me back. I cried out to God and it was he who set me free. That day I made a conscious decision to live, heal, and forgive. That's when my life turned around. My last exam, yep. You guessed it. I'm blind enough. Well, chicken thunder. <laughs> I live happily ever after. Of course not. In order to heal, you must keep it real. I learned how to be invisible, and now I had to unlearn those unhealthy behaviors in order to unlock the door of self-advocacy. This is the season for me to be seen and heard. Um, excuse me, professor. Could you please verbally say what you are writing on the board with frustration? Ms. Price, you can't try to see? Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Every day I try to see. But on this day, I could not see past the embarrassment as I felt eyes of my peers because, yes, I was the only one who was blind enough that I could not see the board. I hid my face as I raced out the class. 
This is no act. I remember like it was yesterday. I shut myself in my house and this was between us. You and me, God, teach me how to live this blind life. I began to research disability rights and advocacy groups for the blind. I refused to be left behind. I learned to be my voice and I no longer was uncomfortable being seen in the room. In fact, I extend my white cane, swing my hair back, and put an extra twist in my hip. Now when I walk in the room, I'm serving light. And I live happily ever after. <laughs> of course not. Now that I possess the will to win, I am accomplishing my goals and adversity don't want to mess with me. Well, simmer down, JP. See, no matter how driven you might be, there will be some challenges along the journey that would give you the opportunity to quit. Oh, that reminds me, my professor in the master's program for clinical mental health counseling told me to quit my first semester of grad school because she never seen a blind counselor. She critiqued me on my client's visuals. Um, Janetta, can you see the client's facials? No, ma'am. According to research, audio cues are more powerful than visuals. This semester was indeed a challenge until I aced my first test. Then she put some respect on my name in my cane. I do believe in second chances though. With that being said, that same professor became my mentor and great friend. She shared with me it was another blind lady before me that wanted special treatment, not reasonable accommodations. It did not excuse her behavior, but now I understand that she thought we were one of the same. Yes, blindness connected us, but we are individuals. All I can say is my professor once was blind, but now she can see. A blind therapist, and that is me. That's right. I am Janetta Price, the blind therapist. Give me a second. Let's rewind. I am Janetta Price, the blind therapist, and yes, I'm blind enough to let you know that losing sight does not mean your life is over, but a new beginning. I'm blind enough to advocate for myself in blind America. I'm blind enough to believe I could be what society told me that I could not be. I'm blind enough to be the change that I did not see. I'm blind enough to zoom in a room and unapologetically, unapologetically be heard and seen. I am blind enough. Thank you. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you all so much. Um, these powerful stories have uh, so much overlap, of course, but I, I also really love what you chose to focus on and the diversity within each one of your stories. So thank you, thank you again. Um, we have time for just probably one question. Um, and so I wanted to ask, this question is geared towards Bill. So Bill wanted to ask you, um, why do you think that the majority of DEI initiatives do not include the disabled community? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's just a historical lack of you know, consideration as that being an identity. I think it's the medical model of, it's not your identity, it's a medical condition. Right. And so that I think that's that's historically why, um, you know, when you see in universities, typically the only the only things that are dedicated to supporting disabled, disabled students are accommodations um, and those those particular specific legal things. Um, but it's, it's just I think it's a new concept to consider it as part of our identity. Um, and, and I think it's really because of that medical model that I was referencing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. Um, and I would love to take more questions, but we are actually out of time. Um, so I just want to thank each one of you again. Um, thank you so much for joining the Aspect Program. I did um, notice in the chat, if anyone is interested in the Aspect Program, you can visit the um, Aspect um, Advocacy Booth, the Patient Advocacy Booth. Um, and um, there's actually an online application as well on our website. Um, it is an interview process. So you apply online and then, um, and then I interview you. So thank you all again. And at this time, I want to pass it over to Jeff Todd, our president and CEO. Thanks, Julie. And, and a special thanks to you, Janetta, Larry, 
and Bill. Wow, what a what an incredible way to to end the day, Jeanette. I'm always so just blown over by your words and and Bill and Larry. Um, first time I've heard you speak, but wow, you equaled that. Um, I just have to say, we see and hear each of you 